um, I got a question that I thought was worth uh, answering in a video because, and I've I've taught on this. Why well, taught on it when I went through First John? Um, so he says, uh, I just heard your video. The, oh, the reason I think it should be answered is because this is a question that a lot of people have. You know, usually these good questions represent more than one person. If you're thinking it, so someone else. So um, anyway, he said, I just heard your video where you spoke about if you sin, you have an advocate with the Father. And that's talking about my video yesterday where I said, look, it's not if you're righteous, you have an advocate with the Father. Because someone had said, well, if, if I don't feel anything about my sins, does that mean God's mad at me? And actually, he hadn't even sinned. Um, he was condemning himself unnecessarily. Um, but we're always condemning ourselves unnecessarily anyway. Um, and then he said, you know, does that mean I don't have an advocate with the father, uh, in one of his questions? And I said, no, it, the, the very verse, if any man sins, we have an advocate with the father, Jesus Christ, the righteous is telling you that you have an advocate when you sin, not when you're righteous, <laughs> you know, it's not, it doesn't say, um, if anyone is righteous, we have an advocate with the Father. It says, if any man sins. So, no, you don't lose your advocate because you've sinned. But this question is related, which is, my question, he says, is this is a different person, but why do we need an advocate with the Father? What does it mean? What do you think Jesus is advocating? One might be tempted to think that God needs to persuade, be persuaded by Jesus to forgive us. And that sounds strange. He's right. God sent Jesus to the earth to redeem us. Jesus did that and said it is finished. So God obviously is aware of the completed work of the cross. What do you think this is about? Um, and he asked, he said I could do a video about it, but okay. So it's, if any man sins, we have an advocate with the father, Jesus Christ, the righteous, who himself is the propitiation for our sins. And not only ours, but the sins of the whole world. Um, it sounds like, to our, and I used to think this too, God's mad at you, but thank God Jesus made peace with him. Because if he didn't, oh boy, you know, and he's standing there pleading and begging God to be merciful for you. Uh, and this is where the pastors get the idea too. They, they use this to support the fact that you need more forgiveness and you got to confess your sins in order to obtain the forgiveness that God will then give you based on Jesus Christ standing there advocating, begging him to. Um, that's not what this is about. First of all, it's an advocate with the Father. Uh, and it is that they are both your advocate. The Son is with the Father. And all through John in the Gospel, um, when he talks about, you know, the, the father who sent me is with me, there's this uh, concept of from, with. And in fact, in the Greek, apparently, and I don't have it in front of me, but there's a word for from, with. That means that the one who is sent is sent by the sender, yet the sender comes with him, from and with. So many times Jesus said he was from the Father, but he also meant from with the Father. And especially in like John 14 through 17, talking about his union and talking about with, with God, you know, as the triune God, um, the Father is in me and I am in him. And the words that I speak, I don't speak of myself, but the Father in me does his works. And that's a prelude to him talking about our union with him, which is, in that day, you'll know that I am in my Father, and my Father in me, and you in me. Because we are in Christ, and Christ is in us, just as the Father is in the Son, and the Son is in the Father. And Christ, because the Father is in him, um, being the tabernacle of God, now he's in us. Well, that means the Father is in us. Uh, do you see that the triune God is in you? Not just a piece of the triune God, but the fullness of the Godhead dwells bodily in Christ and you're complete in him, and he's in you. Um, we don't understand it right now that well, but we will in eternity. <laughs> and by the way, if you want to understand the Trinity, this is how you have to understand it. The Trinity is not a doctrine to just be analyzed. It's a, 
a doctrine that gains what you gain your insight by experiencing your own union with Christ. Once you understand abide in me and I in you, then you can understand the Father in me and, the, and I in the Father. You know, am I the Father? No. Am I, am I Jesus Christ? No. Is, am I not part of Christ? Yes. I am part of Christ. Is he not in me? Yes, he's in me. Am I not in him? Yes. Well, then how come you say that I'm someone else? Because both are true. I'm a branch in the vine. I'm a branch and he's the vine. And yet I'm part of the vine. And you wouldn't say, oh, that's a vine over there and that's a branch over there. No, if you point to the vine, you're pointing to the branches. They're one. The branches are the vine. And yet the branches are branches. Uh, they're one. They're in a union. And yet... They each are, one is the branch and one is the vine. Now, the branch is also the vine, but it's not, see how mysterious this is? You can, you, after a while, you can't even break it down. We're so used to separate items and separate entities that it's hard for us to understand that if something is one, how can it be more, you know? And Jesus is not the Father and the Father is not Jesus, um, the father sent Jesus and yet he came with him. Jesus came from with the father, uh, and they are one. And yet it is the father and the son. Uh, that's mysterious. And yet to a certain extent, we can experience the, the mystery of the triune God, not just as a doctrinal reasoning, but by abiding in Christ and enjoying and tasting him in us and realizing not only is that Christ, that's the triune God. The Father in the Son as the spirit of life dwelling in me and I'm in him. And not only that, but every member of the body of Christ is said to be Christ and reckoned as Christ. We share his righteousness. We share his position. We share his blessing. We have been baptized into him and have put him on, and he's in us. We're crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, we live yet not us, but Christ in us. And yet it's still us. He, Paul said, you know, I've been crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, um, but Christ in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by the son, faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. It's like... You know, I live, but I've been crucified. And yet, nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ. See, it's always a mystery. It's like, what are you talking about? Are you Christ? Is it Christ living in you or is it you living in you? I thought you said you were dead. Yeah, but I'm alive. Oh, so you're living. No, I, I'm, I'm dead. It's not I, but it is I. The life I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God. And yet that life is not my life. It's Christ. What? What? No one who doesn't have uh, the Spirit and no one who is not born again could ever understand that kind of stuff. And yet that's the basis of the Christian life. That's the root of it. And if you don't appreciate this, you can't live the Christian life other than as a rule keeper trying to please God and failing and trying to repent and feeling bad about it. Because you don't know how to walk in the Spirit. You don't acknowledge your union with Christ. That's what we're. That's the mystery of Christ in you, the hope of glory, and what we're here to learn. And we'll be living it for eternity. Um, that was a tangent, a bonus. <laughs> but uh, Christ is the advocate with the Father. And they are one in their work. They're, the Father, like this guy said, the Father sent the Son. Jesus said, for this reason, the Father loves me because I live my life down from the sheep. Uh, this is the commandment I've received from the Father. So he's obedient to the Father in laying his life down for the sheep. It was the Father's will and his will, and he sent him to do his will. And not only that, but he came with him. God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself. God was on the cross in Christ. This is a mystery. It's very deep. However, 
when you say, well, Jesus is the advocate with the Father, that they also, who the ones who really, you know, deal with the confession of sins and all this stuff, end up having an antichrist view of Christ, because they'll tell you that Christ was on the cross and God's wrath was upon him and God couldn't look at sin, so he turned his back on his son and forsook him there on the cross. Well, that means that Jesus was no longer part of the triune God, that the triune God was broken, and that he is not the son of God while he's on the cross? <laughs> no, God was in Christ. Um, and we've talked about this when we talk about the burnt offering. You know, people are familiar with the sin offering for sins, but they don't know the burnt offering, which wasn't for sin. It was for God's satisfaction. Um, Jesus came to do the will of the Father, and in that, he pleased God to the other, uttermost and is a fragrance, a sweet savor of, of uh, a fragrance that goes up to Christ. I'm sorry, goes up to God and is pleasing to him. Um, the burnt offering was the first offering in the book of Leviticus. And it was uh, to be flayed. The, the, the animal was to be flayed. It was a spotless lamb, uh, ram or whatever, uh, flayed. I mean, opened up its inward parts, put on display, and its kidneys were taken out, and its head was taken off, and all that stuff, and it was on the altar, and they burned the fat portion, which would have smelled like a smokehouse. Uh, and that was a type, because the fragrance of that offering went up to God as a, as a pleasing aroma, called a sweet savor. And it was the blood of the burnt offering, which has no reference to your sin, but is entirely a picture of the absolute devotion of Jesus Christ to God. He only does that which is pleasing to the Father. Going up as a savor to God, offered up to him in love. Um, and that aspect of the offering, God draws near. So there's an aspect where the sin offering... The scapegoat was taken out to the wilderness to be burned. God wasn't near to the scapegoat with all the sins on it. But there's another aspect, an inward, uh, uh, inner reality that's the base in which God is drawing near to the burnt offering based on the aroma that's going up. And I say it's the base because it was the blood of the burnt offering that was sprinkled on the altar seven times, which... Um, made the altar most holy so that whatever touched the altar is said to be most holy. And that was the basis for other offerings to be accepted. So for the, the blood of the, for the burnt offering to be accepted, I'm sorry, the sin offering, the trespass offering, um, or any other offering to be acceptable to God, it had to be on the altar that had been sanctified by the blood of the burnt offering. Um, so it's the most important offering and it was offered continually, uh, night and day of fragrance going up to God. And remember Corinthians says we are a fragrance of Christ to God. What is that? Well, we are a, a sweet smelling savor. We are indwelt by the burnt offering. The one who said, behold, the volume of the book is written of me. I come to do thy will. The one to whom God said, Behold, my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased, dwells in us and we in him. And we're one with him, so much so that we are a fragrance of Christ unto God. Now, on the one hand, our righteousness has been imputed to us in the heavens, where God openly displays the value of the sacrifice of Christ to answer all accusations from the principalities and from Satan against us and against him. That's called imputed righteousness, and it has nothing to do with us. On the other hand, we have received the Spirit, who is Christ himself, who is the embodiment of the triune God, it, who comes with the Father. He's from with the Father as living water. And that water in us is has regenerated our spirit so that he who is joined to the spirit 
he who is joined to the Lord is one spirit. And that is a base from which a fragrance of Christ ascends to God and he draws near to us and is pleased to do so because we smell like his beloved son. And God arranged all that. So there is not only your righteousness in heaven, but there is this aspect of the center of your being that is so pleasing to God. He delights in it. And it's his beloved son. And he set the whole universe up to center around this person. That's how important he is. Um, and forever, forever, the aroma of Christ, based on his offering of himself in love to the Father, is the basis for our approach to God and our acceptance in Christ. And because we don't really have a vision of this, we struggle when it comes to sin and condemnation and entertaining accusations and thinking we're not pleasing to God. So it's a really important concept to grasp. The burnt offering and uh, our sanctification that's based on our union with Christ. It's not just positional. It's Christ in you. And if, you, if we could see it, if we could really see things as God has arranged it and hold it in our mind, we would be free from all fears. And I, I really believe that the refreshing that's going to come to the church, uh, at least those who are growing in the knowledge of the truth, which is called an abundant entrance ministered by Christ himself into the kingdom through the knowledge of him, uh, I believe that there's a refreshing coming from this knowledge of our position in Christ and who he is in us. Um, Paul said, you know, that he labored that the saints would, their, their hearts would be comforted, they'd be knit together in love unto all the riches of the full assurance of understanding unto the acknowledgement of the mystery of God, which is Christ. And that mystery is Christ in you, the hope of glory. It's the source of all of our comfort and strength, uh, and peace, and joy. And there's a reason why, I believe, that we're going to go out with joy unspeakable and full of glory, crowns of everlasting joy on our head. The difference between being spoiled by the legalistic teachers and, is, um, and, and being crowned with confidence and boldness in the day of judgment is all about this knowledge of Christ, who he is and what he's done, and what that's made you, what he is in you, and what you are before God, a fragrance of Christ unto God. He's pleased. Okay, so is Jesus up there persuading God not to be angry at us as our advocate? Why do we need an advocate? No, he's an advocate with the Father. They're both advocating for you. Romans 8 says that. Uh, who is he that will lay a charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Um, maybe I should read that verse real quick. Romans 8. Uh, we know. Okay, let's see. What shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? Right? He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not also with him freely give us all things? Who shall lay any charge against God's elect? It's God himself, that's the Father, who justifies. Who is he that condemns? It's Christ himself um, that is risen from the dead, who's at the right hand of God, who makes intercession for us. Interceding that God would be not angry at us? No. His intercession is according to the... Uh, order of Melchizedek, which has no reference to sin. That's what we've been studying in Hebrews. The, the offering's already been done. His intercession is according to the power of his incorruptible life, where he gives us bread and wine for nourishment to establish us in his victory. Over who? The devil and the principalities, who accuse God and man night and day. Right? How do we overcome? By the word, of, the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. Not loving our life unto death. Uh-oh, that means I can't watch TV. 
No, to not love your life unto death is to see yourself hid with Christ in God and to see that there's no more demand on me. I'm dead to the law. I'm dead to sin. I'm dead to the world. There's no accounting of my record. It's been blotted out. My history began with the union that I have with Jesus Christ where I was baptized into his death and made alive together with him. And that's my beginning. And that beginning is renewed every day in the knowledge of Jesus Christ, if I want. And it's called entering into his rest, where the works are finished from the foundation of the world. And you're no longer doing dead works to try to justify yourself before God. You're standing boldly and confidently in the strength of Christ, based on his intercession for you. Because we're weak. And our tendency is to draw back and shrink back. So he has to intercede for us, knowing this weakness, to make us bold to stand before God so that we can receive and stand in our blessing as sons and heirs. Um, God is not there condemning you. So Jesus Christ, it says, uh, if any man sins, he has an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, who is the propitiation for our sins, and not only ours, but the sins of the whole world. Now, the fact that he said Jesus Christ the righteous and propitiation, we learn our doctrine from Paul. Paul's the one who teaches the doctrine of everything God did in Christ. It was his job to teach it as doctrine. And the, the, the place where that doctrine is found is Romans. What is the doctrine of the propitiation? If you only have the Old Testament, you say, well, it's satisfying God's wrath, you know. If you just take the definition. But Paul tells us what it is. We don't go just by dictionary definitions, and we don't go by Old Testament definitions uninformed by Paul's doctrine. No, we stand in Paul's doctrine when we look at the Old Testament and say there were things that are not revealed that are much more clear now. You know, it's progressive revelation. But he says... Uh, um, no, everyone is condemned by the law, right? We all know that. We're all guilty. None has done good, not even one. None seeks God. They've all gone out of the way. Um, so, no one can be justified by the law before God because the law's purpose is to reveal sin. There's no, you know, therefore by the deeds of the law, no one no flesh shall be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. That's the only purpose of the law is to reveal sin. And being full of the knowledge of sin is called sin consciousness. Um, which, according to Hebrews, was what kept people from being... They, they were considered unperfected. Because they had their conscience was not perfected. Because if it had been, they would have had no more consciousness of sin. Sin consciousness makes you afraid in the presence of God. In fact, it makes you die. <laughs> uh, it's called death. Um, and that death is not you cease to exist. It's that you can no longer stand before God without trying to cover yourself with fig leaves, hide from him, justify yourself, do dead religious works. Um, but he says, now the righteousness of God Without the law, apart from the law. Oh, is God antinomian? <laughs> um, without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Even the righteousness which is of God by faith of Jesus Christ unto all those who believe. For there's no difference, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, being justified freely by his grace and the redemption that's in Christ Jesus whom God has set forth to be a propitiation, there's the word, through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of the sins that are past through the forbearance of God and to declare, I say, at this time his righteousness, that he may be just and the justifier of him that believes in Jesus. Okay, what is the definition of the propitiation? Paul tells us. It is a demonstration of the righteousness of God that he may justify sinners 
and ungodly people uh, and make them righteous and accept them as if they're Christ himself. That's what righteousness means. Righteousness is qualification. Righteousness is not saying you're good. Righteousness is saying you are qualified for the blessing the way Christ, based on the merit of Christ. And the blessing is not yours, it's Christ's. He's the seed to whom all the promises are made. He is the heir. And as we've been teaching in Hebrews, we've taught that righteousness is a matter of qualification for the kingdom. The inheritance and the blessing and the uh, the reward, all that stuff, eternal life, God himself, is promised to the heirs. And the heirs are not people who are Israelite by blood. They are people who believe in Jesus Christ. Why? Because all the promises are made to him. He's the seed to whom the promises are made. Uh, and the law came in for transgressions until the seed should come to whom the promises are made, according to Galatians 3, so that those who were dealing with things of the kingdom wouldn't think that they are in the kingdom. They would understand that the kingdom has not come yet. The heir has not come yet. Our inheritance is based on our relationship to Christ. And if he hasn't entered into his inheritance, you're not entering into yours. <laughs> That's why in the Old Testament, the saints didn't have the perfecting of the conscience and they didn't have the presence of God in the way we did. They didn't enjoy the washing we know or should know. It's because Christ had not entered in through the holiest by his own blood and offered himself. The burnt offering hadn't been realized yet in time. He'd not actually entered into his inheritance as the heir blessed uh, with joy of oil of joy, of gladness above his brethren, given a name above every name and seated at the right hand of God. That's the propitiation. The propitiation is Jesus Christ after he finished his work, has entered into the holiest and presented his blood, saying it is finished. Um, and that blood is our redemption and our uh, the manifestation of God's righteousness in dealing with us. Why? Because the accusation is that for God to deal with sinners is unrighteous. That's Satan's accusation. Who's the accuser in the courtroom? Satan and the principalities. And they accuse God of taking a clay monkey man and making him a king. And to them that is disgusting, morally repugnant. They're legalists. Um, and further, they tried to prove it by bringing in man depravity. Bringing man into depravity and bringing him into sin and death. Making him a slave to sin. To show the universe how ridiculous God is for having anything to do with these weak, foolish, abominable creatures and overlooking those beautiful angels with their wisdom and strength. Um, that's the motivation for their hatred for man and the motivation of why there's always been a satanic culture that is, especially with like idolatry, you're brought into worse and worse sins because Satan wants to bring you into utter depravity. <laughs> We're not utterly depraved the way the Calvinists do, but he'd like to get us to a point where no one be able to tell the difference. <laughs> uh, and this is all part of an accusation, not at us, but at God. Okay, so the propitiation is the manifestation of God's righteousness Apart from the law, that's really important to understand. It is not that the law approves of Jesus Christ because he's an excellent law keeper and he came and kept the law for you. No, he, the, he is the reality. The law is just a shadow. His righteousness goes far beyond what the law describes. And the, the best example is the propitiation because according to righteousness by law, he would have nothing to do with us. He would cast us all into the lake of fire the minute we broke the law. Uh, which is what Satan wants, because he knows that's where he's going and he's looking for company that he can beat forever, you know. But uh, 
the law, the righteousness which is according to the law is all about infractions. And the law has nothing to say to Jesus Christ because he doesn't make any infractions. And I use the example all the time. Um, you don't tell a straight-A student, you better not get D's and F's and cheat. If I find out you're cheating, I'm going to beat you. No, because they're a straight-A student. Why would you say that? That's what you tell to a D or F student. And the law was given not for the righteous, but for the wicked. Its, it's only purpose is to expose sin. And Jesus Christ has no sin. And in the propitiation, he demonstrated what love your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And love your neighbor, not just your brother, not just your friend, but the poor beaten guy on the street as yourself. He used the good Samaritan. And he gave his own life to give us the oil and the wine to treat our wounds and bring us into himself as the inn and restore us. When we were enemies, ungodly, unworthy, and condemned, the law said, condemn them to death. The wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. And the law came through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Don't listen to teachers who try to tell you that the law is compatible with grace and that you should mingle them together. No, the law is here to expose the sin of sinners and show them their need. Well, really just show them their condemnation. The gospel is what declares what they really need, which is Jesus Christ himself to become their life and their righteousness. And remember, it is ungodly sinners who uh, receive justification, which means qualification to receive everything God has for Christ. And that qualification is nothing other than Christ himself. As the burnt offering... Ascending to God as a sweet smelling savor forever in you now, so that God loves you and is pleased with what comes out up to Him from you that He looks at. He's looking at your spirit. Uh, now, the propitiation is the manifestation of God's righteousness, right? Who God has set forth through faith in his blood, to declare his righteousness for the remission of the sins past. Now, that some people will say, well, that means he only forgave your past sins. But every sin you commit now, you have to repent or else it's not forgiven. Confess or it's not forgiven. You have an advocate, but you don't have an advocate if you don't confess. And he's going to keep God's wrath off of you. See how wrong they are? Um, no, what he's talking about here, the sins that are past is the sins that were committed by the Jews under the first covenant who were doing offerings that could not uh, do anything for their sins. They were just a picture. Well, how do they get to partake of, how do, how do they get to be justified? Well, Jesus Christ forgave their sins based on his work that he'd not yet done. <laughs> um, they were offering pictures. And Hebrews says the same thing in chapter 9, that Christ died... Uh, he offered himself for the redemption of the transgressions that were committed under the first covenant, the Mosaic covenant. While they were under law, they were sinning and offering and sinning and offering. And yet we're told in Hebrews that those sin, those offerings could not perfect them. Couldn't deal with sin. They only served as a reminder of sin. And they didn't allow the people to draw near to God. They actually kept them from being able to draw near to God. That's what the ordinances are. Their enmity between man and God. Um, how did God justify people like David, who could say, Blessed is he who, to whom God will not impute iniquity, to him whose sins are forgiven? Well, because of the redemption that's in Christ, it, two thousand, you know, a couple thousand years later, because it's retroactive, he died for the transgressions that were committed under the first covenant. Those are all past tense. When he died... It was the end of the first covenant. So at that point, when he rose and is the propitiation to forgive sins under the first covenant means he's forgiving past tense, retroactive. Okay. So it says God set him forth to be a propitiation by faith in his blood to declare his righteousness, God's righteousness 
For the remission of sins that are past, through the forbearance of God, he forbore those sins because the sacrifice had not been made yet. And that he's just in the present time, at this time. To declare, I say, at this time his righteousness, that he might be in the present just and the justifier of him that believes in Jesus. Now, the one who's justified today has a much better benefit. Why? Because the heir has entered into his promise. See, we only get as much as Christ is inherited because we're co-heirs together with Christ. In Abraham's time, Christ was in his loins, not having come forth yet, and hadn't entered into anything. All he had was Abraham. <laughs> um, in Israel's time, when the nation was born at Sinai after the deliverance from Egypt, that was the day they're said to be born, Christ had gained a nation. And then that nation, he led into the land. And Christ had a foothold in the land. Okay? Uh, this is all what he's inheriting as a result of a process. Well, now, Christ has incarnated, become a man, possessed humanity, flesh and blood. And as the last Adam, he's terminated all the sins and condemned them in his flesh and executed the sentence, carried it out in full. There's no more judgment from the law. It's done. And he's he blotted out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us and contrary, taking it out of his way, nailing it to the cross. And when he said, it is finished, the word is to tell us die, which means debt paid in full. There is no debt for your sins. It's been paid. Uh, including groveling before God and asking for forgiveness. <laughs> and then he rose from the dead as the firstborn. See, he was the only begotten son all the way up to his death. But in his resurrection, he's called the firstborn from among the dead and the firstborn from all of all, uh, I'm sorry, firstborn of uh, many brethren who are to be conformed to his image and glorified. And now he's ascended to the heaven and inherited a name which is greater than every other name. That was the ultimate realization to the promise made to him through Abraham, I will make your name great. His name is so great that every tongue and every knee will bow, every tongue will confess that he is Lord. Whether in heaven, under the heaven, on earth, principality, his name is a name greater than any name, not only in this age, but in the age to come. And he's seated, not on the earth alone, but in the heavens. Okay, this is his inheritance. At the right hand of God, as the seed of David, God had said to him, sit, my God said to the, my God, in Psalm 110, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool. And then he said, I've sworn to not repent. You are a high priest according to the order of Melchizedek forever. He gained this new priesthood, which is backed by his kingship, where he has, has authority all over heaven and earth, so that he becomes head over all things to the church. The next thing he gains in his inheritance by releasing the spirit is the church, which is his body, which according to Ephesians 1.23 is said to be his fullness, the fullness of him who fills all in all. And that's a mystery that was hidden in God's heart, and is now revealed through Paul's ministry that we are members of Christ and have put him on. And this is a special group that are the first uh, manifestation of his inheritance on the earth. And it's called the riches of his glory and the, of his, the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. So Paul prayed in Ephesians that we receive a spirit of wisdom and revelation and the full knowledge of him, that the eyes of our heart would be enlightened that we would know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, and what is the exceeding greatness of his power towards us who believe, which is according to the working of the strength of his might, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him in his own right hand in the heavenlies, far above all rule and authority, and every name that is named, not only in this age, but the ages to come. And he's given him to be head over all things, to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. That is his inheritance, the first portion of his inheritance. 
But he also was told that he would inherit the nations. Right? Psalm 2. Ask, you are my son this day, I have begotten thee. Ask of me, and I will give you the nations as your inheritance, which you will rule with a rod of iron. That has not happened yet. And he was promised a throne according to the same covenant, the Davidic throne, in Israel. And Gabriel confirmed it when he announced um, to Mary who Jesus was going to be. You're going to call his name Jesus. He's going to sit on the throne of David, his father. That is not talking about the throne of God in heaven. That's talking about a throne on earth where he will rule the nations with a rod of iron. See, people try to say, well, that this is all allegorical. Uh... The church is Israel. There is no coming kingdom. We just go to heaven. Christ is on the throne of David. It's in the heavens. Well, you're robbing him of his inheritance and you're allegorizing the very promises that give you your salvation. So why can't I just say eternal life is allegorical? He just meant you're going to live better today. You know, they have to allegorize away the throne of David and the coming kingdom and his rule over the nations. They say, well, that's the church. You know, we'll, uh, we're under his rule. Really? With a rod of iron? No, our rule is we're bone of his bone and flesh of his flesh. We're one body. And it's a rule not of law, but of life. Uh, just like your body works, not because you tell it to work, but because the life in it works. Um, no, the, the rule with the rod of iron is during the millennium. When the nations still have a chance to rebel. Or they'll say, well, the church is ruling with the rod of iron now as we legis legislate good morality. And we'll get the world so good that Christ will eventually come back because it's so good. <laughs> no, there's a throne he's going to possess. And that's what the book of Revelation is about, is him, um, the kingdoms of the world, becoming the kingdoms of Christ, and of his God, according to the promise to the seed of David. That's the whole point. You know, John wept convulsively because there was no one qualified to open the book. And it seals in Revelation 5. And the angel said, fear not. The lion of the tribe of Judah, the root and offspring of David, has prevailed and overcome and can open the seals. That means he's the, the heir He's the one qualified, and not only is he qualified because he's the heir, but he's qualified by his own righteousness, which is put on display. And the only reason he's doing all this is so that he can take un ungodly sinners like us and share his inheritance with us freely. Not based on any work we did, believe me. And the church's portion is the best right now because... Well, we're the only ones saved <laughs> right now. But our portion now is that we're seated in the heavenlies with Christ and we're one with him, baptized into him, buried with him, dead in him, and alive together with him, raised up and seated in the heavenlies. It's a whole different position than, you know, ask of me and I'll give you the nations to rule with a rod of iron. Who cares about the nations? The nations are dropping the bucket. I've got Christ. But during the millennium, there will be people who will enjoy a time of benevolent rulership of Christ as mortals. Um, will they be heavenly in the same way we are? Well, not manifestly. We will be glorified at that time. See, to allegorize this stuff, you take apart the whole kingdom. You take apart God's purpose. You take apart everything. Uh, and it's hard for me not to come back to that crap, but... I can't stand it when people allegorize the Bible. <laughs> you know, it's interesting. I, I'm, I'm the only one for a while that was teaching that we're not under the New Covenant. Everybody was calling me a heretic. heretic. Um, the other day I was on, I was testing these different language models. Not GBT, but I'm looking for open source alternatives that won't censor. And uh, there's one called Claude, Anthropic Claude. Very good, but... Uh, I just asked it to see if it knew Bible knowledge. And I said, do you know what Ephesians 3, 6 is? I just, I didn't, I didn't even remember that that was the one that said we're fellow heirs of the promise as Gentiles. And it told me the verse and then gave me this long explanation about how that means that the Gentiles partake of Israel's promises. 
And I said, can you explain a little more about how you believe, well, not you believe, but how, how it is that Gentiles partake of the promises with Israel? Because that's a misinterpretation of that verse. That verse doesn't say we are fellow heirs together with Israel of their promises. It says we're fellow heirs with Christ of his position in the heavens, which is where he's at now. He's not yet possessed the earth. That's why we can't partake of that promise yet of ruling over the earth. The kingdom has not yet been manifested. Hebrews makes that real clear. We don't yet see everything subjected to him. So we can't say we're kings on the earth, uh, ruling the nations. That's not come yet. Because you don't get to inherit what Christ has not yet inherited. And that's why Abraham didn't have what we have. That's why David lived with sin consciousness that we don't have to. Because the offering had not been made yet. The holiest had not yet been opened yet. There was not a washing available to those who come near so that they no longer have the consciousness of fear and are freed from the bondage of sin and death, uh, the spirit of bondage and fear, because Satan has been put out of the way and nullified and the principalities have been triumphed over. No, our position is so much greater even though we're still justified by faith because Christ has entered into his heavenly inheritance. But he still has an earthly inheritance. He's reconciling all things in heaven and on earth, not just the heavens. And through that, he has, a, you know, for that, he has this kingdom, which is yet to come. Um, but anyway, I was talking to Claude, the GPT model, and it said, uh, well, in order to understand how the Gentiles partake of Israel's blessings requires, and I hadn't said anything. All I asked was, how can you explain how this is possible? It said it requires allegorization, a nuanced approach to the Bible that incorporates the principle of allegorization. It said that, not me. And I should have saved the, the conversation. I might try to ha recreate it. It may say something different next time. They're unpredictable. Uh, it requires allegorization, and then it said that some people, like dispensationalists, insist on a literal interpretation of the scriptures, which makes it so that they can't partake of the promises. Now, what promises is it talking about? The promise of the land. What is it talking about when it's talking about allegorization? Allegorizing the parts of the promises to Christ related to his inheritance and saying he won't literally possess the nations the nations means something spiritual and that's how gentiles can partake it it is the equivalent of the pharisees saying there's the heir let's kill him so that we can have his inheritance and that's the tragic history of allegorizing the promises to christ and putting them on the church as if there are inheritance apart from him is auschwitz you know a starts for allegorization and Auschwitz. It's anti-Semitic, uh, but it's also anti-Christ. And yes, you can theoretically be grace, but you can't enjoy it in full um, if you allegorize these promises because then you have no way to distinguish between our judgment seat and the judgment seat of the nations. They're all just one big thing. Where, you know, that's what you want to ask someone who's allegorizing the scriptures to say we're under the new covenant is say, then where is your judgment? And they will have to tell you that it's the same as, uh, you know, the judgment of the nations, Matthew 25, the sheep and the goat, and that ultimately you'll be judged on whether or not you fed the poor and clothed the naked, right? And they'll also tell you that you'll give an answer for every idle word you speak. And they borrow that from the great white throne judgment because to them, the distinctions between the church and Israel are, are allegorical. There is no distinction. We are Israel. Well, that means we don't have a separate stand in the day of Christ when he's revealed and we're before him in the heavens. And it's a victory parade. That is a different arrangement altogether than anything that was revealed by the prophets. And it has different rules. It doesn't, you know... So the reason I say you can't be grace and allegorize these things is because your view of the judgment seat is going to impact your view of what are the rules of the race.
And if you think that the great white throne and the and the the Davidic throne and the Bema seat are all just one judgment, then you incorporate all their rules and make a sanctification by works for the Christian life. And people do that subconsciously anyway, but through the new covenant, they formalize it. It is works-based sanctification. It's a backload of works. It's an antichrist doctrine to say that we are partakers of the new covenant because it, it, it forcibly dissolves the distinction between Israel and the church, allegorizing all their promises so that we can say we're in the land. Because there are no promises to Israel in that covenant except the ones that are related to the land. Anyway, I um, believe it or not, this is all relevant. This is like the worst message ever as far as tangents go. What does it mean that Christ is the propitiation and advocate with the Father? The propitiation means that he is the manifestation of God's righteousness so that God can be just in passing over the sins that were previously committed. And as it says in Hebrews 9, he obtained redemption for the transgressions under the first covenant. That's how, by the way, he can uh, have a new covenant with Israel. is because he paid for the sins under the first. He died for the nation. But he also died for us as individuals. We have a status... Just like Israelites, they have a status as justified saints before the Lord, like Daniel. But he also has a status as a member of a nation that was judged for its sins under the law while he himself was blessed in Babylon. Even though he couldn't keep the law because the temple had been destroyed, he was blessed and exalted in Babylon because he was justified by faith. Um... And that's hard for us to get our mind around that God can judge the nation and bless the individuals who are justified by faith. He deals with the nation by law. He deals with the individuals by faith. Yeah, it has to do with their leadership and their policy. They're a theocracy. And that nation was cut off because of its national rejection of their Messiah to try to steal his inheritance and kill him. Um, they were cut off. But they'll be grafted back in. Why? Because Christ died for the redemption of the transgressions under the first covenant so that everyone who's justified by faith and is a member of Israel can still enjoy the blessings that were promised to the fathers. He's faithful. Well, what are we? We're individually justified, but we're members not of a nation called Israel, but of Christ himself. Uh, we are associated directly with him in an organic relationship that was established because of his resurrection, he received the promise of the Father, which is the spirit that he gave to us. And that's the spirit of sonship uh, that makes us the sons of God and makes us full of his life, members of the body. That's a different position than David. David was not a member of the body of Christ. Okay, And, and the body of Christ is not a mem members of the nation Israel. There is a distinction. Anyway, Christ has entered into this heavenly portion of his inheritance, and we enjoy that with him. We're blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavens. Even though on earth we suffer. Why do we suffer on earth? Because he has not yet subjected the earth. He's not received that portion of his inheritance yet. That's yet future. Uh, <laughs> Chuck Missler used to say to people who allegorize the kingdom and say, well, this is the kingdom now. He said, well, if Jesus is ruling today, he's doing a pretty bad job. <laughs> no, he's head over all things to the church. Um, he has the position to do work all things together for our good in space and time. Use it for fodder for his elect. But he's not yet taken possession of everything and manifested his rule openly. So we still suffer because we're both on the earth and in the heavens. But even though we suffer, we can partake of comforts that are heavenly because that, that the old Testament saints did not have available to them because we've been made one with Christ and he dwells in us and us in him. Now this has nothing to do with our righteousness. It's all based on his. And yes, he's an advocate with the father. Who is the accuser? Satan and the principalities. That's why we're said we have to put on the armor of God 
to stand in the evil day. Because we wrestle not with flesh and blood, but with principalities. How do they t- attack us? Well, through ordinances and law that bring us into sin consciousness and make us shrink back from God so that we don't experience the blessing of reconciliation in our being, even though we're reconciled in truth. And Colossians 2 says it this way. Uh, I'm almost done. He says, you were circumcised. He's the head of all rule and authority, all principality and power. In him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and you're complete in him. In whom also you were circumcised with the circumcision made without hands, and the putting off of the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. Now that's talking about putting off natural strength, but I don't have time to get into it. Uh, in favor of the new creation of God, which is out from God and is entirely based on Christ's resurrection. We've been buried with him in baptism, wherein we were raised with him through the faith of the operation of God, who raised him from the dead. And you being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, made you alive together with him, having forgiven you all your trespasses, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us. There's what's against us. The handwriting of ordinances that was against us. Contrary to us, he took it out of the way and nailed it to his cross. And having spoiled the principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. In what? In his blotting out of the handwriting and ordinances and in the circumcision and the determination of the old man. See, it's not that he fought the principalities and beat them and, and kicked them, you know, right there. No, that's yet future. But what he did do is disarm them. That's what it means he spoiled them. To spoil them means he took their goods and their weapons. They, the, and what was their weapon? The law. And what was their goods? All of us who were slavery to sin because of the continual accusations of a defiled conscience. And that was produced by Satan and fallen angels. Okay? There's not just men sinning. There's also angels that keep him bound in the consciousness of sin. And we talked about this in Hebrews recently when we were in chapter 2. That Christ, because the children are partakers of flesh and blood, Christ partook of the same, that through death he might destroy him who had power over death, that is the devil, so that he may release those who through fear of death were subject to bondage of all their life. What, where did, what was the source of their fear? Well, it was the one who had power over death, Satan, who held them in bondage. And how did Christ deal with him? Um, well, he through his death on the cross, if we had to put that together with this, he blotted out everything that was against us, all the ordinances that Satan could use to accuse us and accuse God. You can't deal with these sinful people. You've got to throw them in the lake of fire. That's what the law says. You say, is that how Satan acts? Yeah, don't you remember the adulterous woman? They brought her before Jesus, and you think she thought that all the attention was on her. She was ashamed, and she'd been caught in the act, maybe with one of them, who knows. Uh, and she thinks that the next thing that's going to happen to her is that she's going to die. Because she's going to be stoned. And they're bringing her to Jesus Christ, the righteous, the seed of David, to see what he's going to do. Are they looking at her? No, they're looking at him. Why? Because they're looking for ground to accuse him. Because if he says, well, if she committed adultery, uh, then I forgive her. He's unrighteous by the law's standard. He's only righteous if he, in their mind, if he condemns her to death. And picks up the first stone. But what he did was he said, he wrote on the ground, and who knows, maybe he wrote the name of three of the guys in the group that had done stuff with her. I don't know. But he wrote something. And then he said, whoever among you is without sin, let him cast the first stone. Now what he was doing was he was acting out a miniature of Romans 3. Because Romans 3 says, look, we know that the law 
whoever, you know, it is written, there's not one righteous. No, not one. There's none that understands. There's none that seeks after God. They've all gone out of the way. They're all unprofitable, right? Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their ways. The way of peace they've not known. There's no fear of God in their eyes. That's everybody. Now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. Okay, so the law is speaking to everybody. And they're all guilty. And what Jesus is saying is, well, if I stone her, I'm going to have to stone you guys first. It's not just... When he says, let he who is without sin cast the first stone, do you know what he was saying? Give me a stone, and you're next. If you're going to have me do this to her, you're next. And I can throw harder than you, I'm God. (laughs) I can throw a stone faster than you can run, believe me. Uh, He's the one without sin, and he's the only one that has a right to pick up a stone. And yet he didn't come to condemn the world, but to save it. So you have to know the heart of God in all this. He is for us. When Jesus was announced to the shepherds, it was peace on earth and goodwill to men. That's hard for me to understand. I don't like people. Uh, anyway, the, all the world may become guilty before God. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, no flesh shall be justified. For by the laws of the knowledge of sin, so we are all without hope. But now the righteousness of God is put on display. See, our righteousness, what's our righteousness? Condemned. There's none righteous. For the self-righteous Pharisee, he has no righteousness. These Pharisees thought they were righteous and were telling Jesus the only way he could be righteous would be to stone her. But he is saying, no, none of you are righteous. I'm the only one that's righteous. Give me a stone. (laughs) You know, I'll show you. Uh, And it's the same today. He has everything now. He's got the keys of hell and death. He's manifested the righteousness of God in paying for our sins and condemning them and carrying out the judgment on himself so that now he's just. He paid the price for us, the redemption, and he forgave our sins. And what does that qualify him to do? Stand before God and beg him to forgive us every time we sin? No, it qualifies him as the representative of the human race, the last Adam, the seed of Abraham, the seed of David, to whom all the promises are made, to enter into his inheritance and make it a free gift to all of us. Anyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. If you believe that Jesus was died for your sins and rose from the dead, you believe the message of the gospel is the power of God unto salvation, and that salvation makes you a co-heir together with Christ. <laughs> That's what righteousness is. And the question of righteousness is, how is God qualified to give all this blessing to you? So when John says, if any man sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, who himself is the propitiation for our sins, he's pointing back to this, saying he is righteous. No one can accuse him of anything, and he's the one who paid for your sins. He redeemed you, and he's justified you. And prove that God is righteous in doing it this way because he paid for it all. That shut the mouth of Satan, or should have, and spoiled the principalities. Because even though Satan accuses us, through the knowledge of the truth, we can get set free from the spirit of bondage and fear and begin to stand boldly before God based on being equipped with the truth. Knowing that God is for us and is not accusing us but rather is justifying us. And Jesus is the advocate with the Father against all these accusations. And as the advocate, not only does he speak against those accusations to Satan, he advocates to you by bringing the gospel to you. He's the apostle of your profession. And he's the high priest as well, interceding for you so that you'll be strong to lay hold of this good news and stand in it. Boldly before God, which is a shame to the principalities. And that's how we overcome him, Satan and the, you know, the accuser, um, is by standing in the truth, based on Christ's work, not only on the cross, but now as our high priest, bringing the truth to us through the New Testament ministry, and then strengthening us within by the Spirit. 
the paraclete, the other comforter, which is Christ himself, who is the embodiment of the triune God. In him dwells all the fullness of Godhead bodily, and now he's in you, available to you freely. The Antichrists in 1 John were accusing the saints of not being saved and refusing to recognize them as children of God. And they were like the Pharisees, only bringing accusations. And when John talks about if anybody sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. We believe he's the propitiation for our sins and the propitiation for the sins of the whole world. How can I deny a brother who has the testimony as being a brother. You know, I can't. Without cutting the ground out from under my feet and calling Jesus Christ a liar and saying that the gospel is not true. Uh, okay. Well, this was... Usually when I feel like these are a mess and my mind is all over the place, um, it turns out that they're actually pretty clear. So I'm going to go ahead and upload it. <laughs> we'll see.